Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Lava Lava. I'm your host, Milford Tiafala, joined by the crew, Michael Tan and Atimu Amini. And tonight we are honored to have with us the one and only Will <laughs> Fanene or William Fanene Goldsmith or Viliamu Fanene or Amu Uso. Some of you might know him as husband, father, entrepreneur, content creator, and DJ. A lot of things, a lot of hats. This this man is the jack of all trades. I right, hey, welcome, Will. Thank you for that uh, beautiful, <laughs> awesome opening. I, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. Thanks for the invite. I really appreciate it. Hey, right. anytime, man. We, we're just glad to have you join us. So with us, you know, we, like a lot of Samoan kids, we love our parents. And I know from your documentary, you know, you gave a lot of love towards them and sort of spoke on them a little bit. So would you take this time to go ahead and uh, tell us about your parents, you know, their names, where they're from, and, you know, the the influence that each of them had on your life. Okay. So uh, my, my mom, uh, Malia Fanene, um, she's now she's married, so she's Malia Imo. And they, she lives up in, um, in Spokane, Washington. So I, I visit there frequently throughout, you know, the year. And um, my dad is uh, Joe Goldsmith. So he's not, obviously, he's not a Samoan guy. He's an um, African-American guy. He lives not far from me. And then I also have uh, two step-parents. Both of them are Samoan step-parents. So my, my dad married a Samoan lady twice. <laughs> two different Samoan ladies. So uh, my stepmom, she she passed away several years ago. Uh, Lucy, Lucy Anga. I don't know if anyone is uh, know, knows Lucy, but... Uh, my sister, my my stepsister. I don't. We don't say step and all that. You know, we don't need. We don't do that in in our culture. So, uh, she's my sister. So Daniela Anga, uh, she's also married now. So she's a Siofele, and she lives out in um in Southern California. And then uh, Fakuya Imo. That's my my stepdad. Again, we don't say stepdad. That's my that's my other dad, and he's up in Spokane, Washington too. So all of them had intricate parts to play in my life growing up and um you know it's i mean it's bad this not it's not bad but you know i don't want to say that i would it's good everybody you know they got divorced or whatever but if they didn't get divorced i wouldn't have met all of these wonderful people and they all helped to shape my life and make it to be what it is so i mean you only know what you know i know growing up in a divorced military family that traveled around a lot and you know things weren't always perfect but you know I wouldn't have it any other way. And, you know, that's, that's my life. But I, yeah, those, those are my parents, all, all four of my parents. And I have a whole bunch of uh, other siblings, bonus siblings, extra siblings and, and all of that. And I appreciate all of them. Awesome, man. Thank you for telling us about them. And you got some similarities between myself and, and Michael Tan with okay. Michael. He, this whole podcast deal, he handles, you know, the editing, marketing, pretty much everything. And then uh, same thing with you, how you, you know, you're like a, the one man behind it all. You know, you you might use your, your other <laughs> aliases, you know, and credit. It may seem like credit goes to somebody else, but people don't know it. Like, hey, the person that's making this whole show run, it's Will. You know? Yeah. And that's pretty dope. But at the same time, I'm also an Army brat. Uh, okay. Know? Yeah, my, my father was in the Army, uh, moved around a lot. And I don't know if you can tell by my accent that uh, both my parents are from Western Samoa, by the way. But okay. I, I wasn't really taught, you know, customs and traditions and, and the language as much as, you know, a lot of my counterparts are. You know, I was ignorant to a lot of it. And, I mean, some, you know, picked up the hard way. But, you know, that's why when as soon as you started posting your content, I was like, Oh heck yeah! <laughs> you know, okay, we, okay. This is awesome. We got this going on. But uh, so, did any of that moving around? Like, I, I know I'm, I might reference the documentary a lot, but I don't awesome. want to give away too much. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm gonna ask you. You know, like we're just meeting you. Um, moving around a lot as that young child. You know, did it bother you 
at all, no. you know, picking up and moving all the time, making new relationships. No, that's all I knew. So to me, that was normal life. And the, the funny part about it is everywhere we moved to, it was a Samoan community. So we moved to, it didn't matter if it was Germany, different parts in Germany, you know, if it was Hawaii or, you know, all throughout, you know, California, even in Missouri, like everywhere we went to. So I thought most of the world was Samoan. <laughs> I thought most of the world was Samoan until, you know, I, then some of the places that we moved to, I was like, man, where's everybody at? Like, where, what's all these black people doing here? What's all these white people doing here? Like, where, you know, where, <laughs> where is our people? And um, so it, it took a little adjustment to know that the world is a big place with a whole different, you know, type of, you know, a diversity of people. And that's really what I adapted to. And that's what I like. I like being around, you know, I love being around Samoan people. I love being around, you know, black folks. I love being around, I, but I like being around everybody. I want to have that exchange with everyone. So to me, that is the perfect world where everybody is together everybody's getting along everybody shares with one another so whenever i get into an environment where it's not like that and people are not it, it things just seem kind of stagnant i get bored and i get uh you know i don't i don't like being there <laughs> you know I, so i i, I want to leave so uh even though it's like that kind you know it's like that here it's mainly like black folks and white folks still here there's not that many samoans but um I, I travel a lot. Well, I used to travel a lot before I got on probation <laughs> and all of that. But, bef um, you know, I just, whenever I get too bored, I just go and just, I want to see other people. I want to have other experiences that are outside of the norm, you know, where I'm at. So I love, I, if anything, the military experience and traveling a lot helped me just to be someone that craves diversity and tra uh, craves, um, you know, culture and experience uh, and not just my own and I, I appreciate other people's experiences man so in watching the documentary referencing it again mm -hmm. it it seems to be like a tale of or at least the the words that resonate with me while watching it and, and thinking about it are adaptability perseverance and accountability and you're kind of already speaking on that adaptability part uh, right now, speaking of how you, you know, crave different experiences and diversity. So that's that's pretty cool. At this moment right now, Michael or Ati, you have any questions? Oh, yeah, definitely. Hey, Will, hey, appreciate you, Uso, man, uh, hopping on and taking your time to, uh, you know, discuss uh, a lot of uh, part about your life, you know, with, uh, with us, Fio Poco uh, Usos over here. So I, I could relate to what you were mentioning, uh, you know, and about, you know, not putting labels, you know, in our culture, you know, in Samoan and you're like, hey, that's my uh, mother-in-law or, you know, step, you know, all that, you know, titles and stuff. Uh, because, you know, I'm the same way, you know, growing up, you know, I was, you know, that's cousin over there, that's uncle and that's auntie. And then all my my uh, my Palangi friends, you know, they're like, hey, well, what do you mean by by that? I'm like, uh, that's that's uh, that's my uncle. I was like, yeah, yeah, but is that un uncle on, on your mom or dad's side? You, you know, try to get specific. I'm like, nah, man, that, that's <laughs> uncle right there, you know. So I, I know what you mean. I know growing up, uh, you know, you're moving a lot. And uh, you said everywhere that you guys went to, you know, there's uh, almost a Samoan community. And, you know, I, I can I can relate to that, you know, uh, because, you know, growing up too, uh, you know, the only place that I've outside of Samoa that I've been to was in California. And, you know, it was it was a big, you know, to me growing up, man, there's a big world. And then, you know, the only people that I kind of knew in California was like, you know, Samoans. And then I'm like, oh, you know, this is this is uh, this must be, you know, how everywhere is. And to me. You know, now that I'm that you're growing up and now that I'm here in, in, in El Paso, you know, I'm in Texas, by the way, in El Paso, of all places. And there's a there's a Samoan community here. And then we kind of discuss it am amongst ourselves. We're like, man, I think there's almost every Samoan have been to all the states, you know, even in Maine. You know, I, I know, uh, you know, there, there's Samoans over there. But for yourself, growing, growing up, you know, going to all these places, how important was it to you to establish an identity? You know, I know you 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 mentioned that, hey, you know, I feel comfortable with, you know, uh, sort of the mix with everybody else. But how important is it to you to establish your own identity? How was it important to you to, like, learn, learn the language, 
uh, you know, being Samoan. You know, I know it's it's kind of hard coming from a place where, you know, you don't really have that that kind of like, you know, centered. You know, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm just you know generalizing here. You know, but you know, moving from place to place is kind of hard to have like established identity. But how important w- was it for you growing up? You know, you and you know specifically for you. Well, th- I mean, that's a really great question because growing up in primarily Samoan communities all over the world, I kept forgetting I'm also half black until like you know somebody reminded me, hey, you know, and then, so th- then they have the black jokes. So I-, I I was used to that growing up. And it was like, dang, all right. So every time I would have like a step back. So it's that that was one thing that I was always like trying to. Um, it was one thing where I was always trying to figure out, well, dang, OK, I am I'm half black, but I don't really know that much of my culture. My dad, it wasn't because my dad didn't want to teach me, but he was always gone. Like he was in the field. If you know anything about like military parents, like they're always gone. So my mom was always gone, too. But then, um, you know, I, I don't know how they work it out, but if one is gone, then they try to keep another one back if, you know, they have kids. So my mom would stay back and then she would take us naturally to the Samoan community. Why would she take us over here when, you know, <laughs> this is what she knows over here? So that's all I knew. But then when people like kind of shunned you out, then it's like, man, OK, now I'm trying to figure out again who I am. So that was a constant struggle uh, the whole my whole life. But, um, you know, th- it only lasts for like maybe a few days. And then after that, you get back to, OK, there I, I got over it. So it wasn't until I got to um, here, it, you know, I mean, it was several years ago. But when I came here to come to college and I was already like 19 years old and um, that's when I got in touch with my my black side, my African-American side. And that's when I start learning about different stuff. And they're like, man, you, bro, you, you know, you, you wear, you wear funny clothes and you walk around with a dress on. I'm like, no, let me tell you what this is. <laughs> this is, is the, you know, it's a lava lava, you know? So I was educating people around here about who I am, where I'm from. They didn't know nothing about Samoa, nothing. This is way back when the rock was like, what is your name? It doesn't matter what your name is. <laughs> that's all they knew. They didn't knew nothing about it. Uh, you know nothing about anything so um i was the 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 go-to person for for that kind of education but it was my mission was to understand black culture understand who i was you know my my other half so um when i got to college i learned about like the black fraternities and the um like black history like i'm here living in an area where like there's the underground railroad all this kind of stuff all this kind of black history. So I got in contact with all of that. And I really like inundated myself with just straight everything black and just kind of, uh, I I never shut it, you know, shut my Samoan side out because that's all I knew, you know? So, but that was when I came back home because nobody wanted to talk about, they didn't even know what they would say Somalian and stuff like that. So, so when I came home, that's when I was like, okay, I put my lava lava back on, you know, and, you know, eat my kalo, you know, and, and my the foods that I made, that's all I knew. So it, it took a while. Like, I guess I was in my 20s. I was like probably in my mid 30s. So that's like 15 years have, have passed where I was like, okay, I don't care. I'm going to Walmart with my lava lava on. And there are people like, what was it? You know, what's this black dude doing with the, <laughs> why is he dressed like that? And it, it was literally like, I heard somebody say that one time. And I'm like, Wow. Okay. But after a while, I was like, I don't care. You know, it's, there's a whole world out here. This, the way that I grew up is everybody did their own thing. They were unique. Some people, they might have been, um, you know, Mexican and Samoan. They might have been Caribbean and, and Russian, like everybody. And they just did what they did. But here, a place like here, they, they didn't understand that people would express themselves and the cultures that they were brought up in. And it's a melting pot. Like, that's how I was like, you know what? I'm going to do my own thing the way that I that I was brought up. If you don't appreciate it, you just don't appreciate it, whatever. And that it just came with maturity and not caring anymore. Because you in your 20s, you care about what everybody thinks or, you know. But 
I just got to the point where it's it's whatever. Like I'm just I'm gonna do me. So thanks for asking that. That's a great question. <laughs> Are you a veteran, military member, law enforcement officer, hospital worker, or educator dreaming of owning your own home? Frontline Heroes is here to make that dream a reality. Their program is designed by a group of realtors, lenders, and escrow specialists who want to give back to those who served our communities. Here's how it works. Their realtors pledge to contribute 25% of their commission, while lenders chip in half a percentage towards closing costs and other fees associated with buying a house. It's their way of honoring your service and making home ownership more attainable. Contact Dan Taylor at 801 812-4200 512-4200 to learn more and take the first step towards owning your own home. Frontline heroes, turning dreams into keys. Now, no worries, Uzo, uh, on top of that, do you think, you know, compared to everywhere else that you stayed outside of, the, of America, do you think we as Americans are more ignorant or are we just, you know, just kind of lazy you know I, I, what i mean is in a sense of like you know how like these these folks are like ah oh, man what's this guy wearing you know it's kind of asking you and kind of you know like all that terminology do you think because even even here like for me growing up in samoa we were we were kind of educated to like to the point where like you know they're the, this is what the mexicans were this is what uh uh, uh blacks were you know this is you know we learn about different cultures so mm-hmm. when i got here a lot of folks were kind of like asking me like hey you know well they, they would come up to me and then just talks you know mexican and then i mm-hmm. would tell them no you know i'll educate them you know do my part on now hey no i'm from a teeny tiny island in the pacific you know and then they were like ah okay we get it now but the thing is how come i know your coach how come i know what you are you know like i kind of i kind of yeah. already understand like you know so is there an ignorance that plays there or is this just that's all people are what, what do you feel about that I think it was definitely ignorance, but I think it's like when when you're coming from a place where you're exposed to all of these things and then you go to a dominant culture. Like so you're down in Texas, like I mean they got the cowboy hat. They understand all they understand the dominant culture. But then when you come with, you know, you're you know, you're brown, you know, you got a nice size, you're handsome, they're they're like, Oh, yeah, it must be a Mexican dude. I don't know, no nothing else. So they're ignorant, they don't know. So they only know they can only put you in these few categories. But when you're already yeah. exposed to all of these things, like, man, he's kind of got some more features I've, for in my experience, like um, only people that knew that were like the military kids because they were exposed to all of these different kind of people. Um, they moved around. But if, if this is the only place you grew up, you only grew up in, um, you know, Austin, Texas or St. Louis, Missouri, you only know these boxes of people is it black white mexican or it that's it so if you come in you know being a samoan oh here comes a big gay dude with a what it's a yeah, lava lava and i'm a samoan what are you talking about you know they just don't know so it is it's definitely ignorance and um exposure so yeah <laughs> that's all it is ignorance and exposure yeah i, I recently was doing research because i thought in Utah, there was a a larger percentage of African Americans that reside here. I thought it was in the twenties, but I just found out that only two percent, about two percent of Utah, uh-huh. is African American, and only point nine percent are Pacific Islanders here in really? Utah. And and you can comp- and you can look at the chart across the whole U.S. Most mm-hmm. of the states are like one to two percent the only state that's that's up there in regards to like african-americans and other minority groups are california Mm -hmm. but that's an interesting fact that here in utah only two percent are african-americans so that kind of blew my mind because the whole time i was challenging my 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 white friends that hey i've been out to the community and i actually see black folks out there uh-huh. so so and they were like challenging me so until until i i looked up the senses and all that information that's when my eyes were open oh man there's actually less of minorities here in utah and and that's just across the whole u.s so 
um, I'm, I'm along, I'm along the same boat, boat as you will. Um, mm -hmm. half Chinese, half Samoan, born okay. and raised in American Samoa. So I, I felt disconnected with my Chinese heritage until recent years, like in my late twenties. That's when I started wanting to find out more of my, my dad's side, the Chinese mm -hmm. side, because I grew up knowing the Samoan heritage, knowing Fa Samoa, that I thought in my head that I was Samoan, but it, it, people kind of checked me and said, oh, you you might think you're Samoan, but outside you look Asian. Yeah. So the whole time people were, were thinking I was Asian, but I, I, I was identifying myself as a Samoan mostly because of the way that I was thinking. Mm -hmm. of of who I am so that that was kind of the same struggles that I went through as your as yourself uh, trying to find our our own identity of, and where we kind of belong in in society so i want to ask these questions cuz you had you you kind of reinvented yourself over the years i know you mentioned that in your documentary but first can you please let our listeners know what the name of the documentary is and where they can find it and then answer this question of who is uh, William Fanini today? Okay. Okay. So the name of the documentary is Nameless Unmasking the Anonymous Life of a Sex Pill Guru. So Nameless is, you know, the main the thing and then, you know, the rest of it is like a subtitle. And then the second part was, who is uh, Will Fanini today? Well, for me, who I am today is who I've always been. And it's just somebody who um, I love people. I love all of my cultures. You know, I love um, my family. I love, you know, Fasa Moa. That's the way that I was brought up. And I think a lot of these things that I was trying to explain, like I literally was on... Um, well, what is today? Sunday? Oh, it's Sunday. So last Monday is when my sentencing was. And people just couldn't understand, like, the mentality of the, the things that I did. Like, I made all of this money. And they were like, well, what did you do with the money? And, you know, and all of that is like, it's, you know, five times more. You just, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I gave the money away. And um, they just couldn't get it. So today... As I said, I'm the same person as I was yesterday. I love, I, I like, love to help people. I love my family. And that's it. That, that's, I mean, that's really in a nutshell. I mean, yeah, that's, I, that pretty much sums it up. Yeah, I, I forgot where I was going with that. But I mean, that, they, they kept, I'll, I'll say it like this. My, even my lawyers were like, what did you do with all of the money? What, what were you doing with that? I don't know. Well, you, you want me to, you want me to list it out? I don't know. People asked me for stuff and I gave it to them. So I think that, that to me, they thought it was a bad thing. To me, I was like, you know, I, what do you need money for? You need it to, for resources. And at the end of the day, you're just gonna, what are you gonna do with it? You're gonna pass it on to somebody else. So for me, I don't care if you give me a billion dollars right now. M most of that I'm just gonna give away. Like, are you going to, um, people buy fla flashy things or it means nothing. So I've been at the point where I, I bought this, I bought that and bought that. It, it did nothing for me. None of that stuff did anything for me. Everything that I did that actually, um, is sustainable, that made me feel good, that lasts is because when, when somebody, um, sends me a note and says, you said this and it, it lasted, you gave me this. That meant the world to me. You did this. It's, and it's always about giving. And that the output is, oh, wow. You know, th that's not something I get online. I'll be bragging about, but I feel good about it. That, that's what does it for me. So, okay, you get a billion dollars. What are you going to do with it? I don't understand the whole, you know, the greed thing. So when I was in, it, it wasn't trial. It was like a sentencing hearing. And you have a prosecutor telling you he's so greedy, he's so this and he's so that. But no, if, if I wouldn't, you know, the stuff that I did with 
the money that you said I got, I have no idea what I did with it because I don't remember who I gave it to. I was just giving it away. And it's, you know, I was good at home. So what what do you do with the excess? And to me, that's just, um, if you, you want to sum up who I am, the excess goes to other people. <laughs> me, I, I, I need what I need. My family's good. Okay, everybody else can get the rest. That's just how it is. That's how I was brought up. So I don't know. I don't understand. If, you know, define who I am. I don't understand what what they're doing over there <laughs> with with all of the the greed and you know kill people, take all of their land, and do all of this stuff. I don't understand all of that. So who who I am is take care of mine, and then after that, if you need it, then you can have it. If I got it, that's that's me. Thank I don't you. know how to explain. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah good. Go ahead, T. <laughs> Uh, uh, not you. Uh, we got it. And the way you are, you know, well, at least from the, an outside perspective, from a distance, just seeing you digitally, uh, you seem like some of the people I know, like Michael, the homie Frank. Uh, you're not, you know, your your emotions, you're never too hype, you know, never too low, too mellow, pessimistic. You know, you you just right there in the middle. I'm even like that too, for I can tell. to an extent, yeah. You know, unless we're like competing in sports, then you, know, you see, you see the ugly side. But you went through some things, you know. You went through your your parents' divorce. You went through your depression, you know, with the struggling relationship with your whole with your first marriage and the distancing uh, in your relationship with your son. But you. You made it all the way out to the other side, still with a giving heart. Is there anything you can recall or anything that comes to mind that helps you, you know, with your mental health? Because that's one big thing we talk about a lot here is the mental health aspect and dealing with it. And which I think you touch on greatly in your documentary as well. But uh, you, even when you recall your experiences, you don't show that kind of like panicky or, you know, like the world's ending type of emotion. You just like, all right, this is happening and I need to get through it. So is there anything from your life that you think contributes to that greatly? Any big moment or teaching throughout your life that happened that, you know, made you and continues to make you the way you are today? Oh, well, I think um, so what my dad told me and you got the, the sign is over there, but I, I had a podcast one time. And um, I do want to start it up again, but it's called Accountability First. I got that from my dad. So it don't matter what happened, what you're involved in, because you brought up my divorce. So my my dad was like, um, you know, I would go complain to him. Yeah, blah, 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 she did this, she did it. He was like, I don't want to hear that. What did I teach you? Accountability first. What did you do? It don't matter if it's if they did 99%. You know, it's it's always in any situation, it's going to be you could have did something. Even if you were a complete victim, somebody came up and did something. What did your dad teach you? What did your mom teach you to avoid stuff like that? Just identify that first. Identify that piece of what you could have did and then start from there. Because if you're always starting at I'm a victim, you know, I'm 100 percent victim, you know, don't have that mentality. So that's one thing. Take your accountability first. And then use your view from from that vantage point. Like, this is what I should have done. And then all of your emotions should have been from that point. That way you don't be blaming everybody else for this and that. Sometimes you're you're way more accountable for, you, you know, what, whatever happened. But it, like I said, sometimes you can look at a situation. It's like, man, they were ab an absolute victim. Well, there's something, may, you know, sometimes it's, yeah, there's nothing you could do. But from in most cases, there's something you could have done. You had some part to play in it. So in terms of like, um, like, again, you brought up my divorce. So it's like there were so many things I could have did. I could have. He's you know, he said, I I, I don't like her. <laughs> you should have don't marry her. I did it anyway. Uh, hey, you, you should have um, you should have did this. Should have did it. I did it anyway. Those are all things on me. So that helps me out in a lot of situations because it it just um it takes me away from looking at you. Well, you did this and you did that. 
no, look at yourself first. And then, I mean, that really just makes everything like, man, had I did this situation, it's a different conversation when you start with yourself first. So accountability first. Man, I forgot uh, uh, one of the YouTube videos I watched and uh, one of the Usos on there was like, you know, we're not really a product of our environment, but we're a product of our own decisions. You know, like whatever decisions that we make, you know, that's who you, you end up going, going, you know, going to be because your environment is always going to be your environment, you know, no matter where you go. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you take blame for your own actions. And if you make your decisions, you got to live and die on that sword. You know, that that decision is yours to make. And at the end of the day, you know, that was your decision to make. So I, I could relate to, to what that uh, what your dad was saying. So I just wanted to, to make a comment on that, but, you know, uh, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I did a lot of um, the, they're like gang. A lot of the people that are like really pro gang culture are um, w when I was doing those kind of posts for that for that amount of time, they were they, they turned against me. They were like, no, this is where we're at. This is our environment. It is what it is. But, you know, if you someone I, I, don't tell me because I lived there. I lived in these communities. Nobody went against the Samoans like that. So you do you. And then this is, this was my message at the time. You be you and they're, they're, they're not going to bother you. You know, so why be this gang or why be that gang? You know, and I, I never could understand that even growing up in it. Like I would run around uh, with the, Oh, I don't want to say the different gangs or whatever, but you know, I was affiliated with them, but I never participated in that stuff because if they didn't mess with you, so I don't understand why, why are you all in, you, you, you're in these people's business. They left Samoans alone. They left the Tongans alone. They left, um, you know, the, they, they left the, um, the Polys, the Fijians, like they didn't mess with anybody. They mess with the people that got involved. So just be you, do your, do your own thing. So I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I never, I never could understand that in our community to, we, we have all of these, these support structures, our parents are bringing down the culture that even if they didn't teach the language, you still had to do, you know, Samoan things. You still had to do, you know, these Polynesian things, the culture. So why get involved with all of that if nobody's going to bother you? I never could under, I, to this day, I, I don't understand that. When people give me the backlash and t it just sounds like excuses to me, nobody's going to mess with you. <laughs> Do you and, 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 and give them the culture. There, there's a dude over here. Everybody wants to be like him. One Samoan guy, right? His son is in the NFL right now. There's not even that many Samoans around here. He has everybody coming over to his house in the backyard. Is you know, is you know, black folks, white folks, Mexican, all these, all these different kind of people back here doing Samoan rituals in his backyard. They want to be like him, just because you know the Samoan culture is so rich and radiant. They come to his house, the Epinesas. You can look the it's AJ Epinesas' dad. They go, everybody goes over to, to his backyard and, and, you know, and there's document is all, all, all the newspapers around here, but they don't know how to explain it. They don't know what's going on, but it's like this man is, he's genuine and he just emulates love. Doesn't matter. You can take that to Carson. You can go to New York or any, any, anywhere and take this culture. People want to emulate that because they feel man, it's, it's something about this guy. You know what? So what I don't understand is we have people just like Epinesa all over the place. So, and th some of these people are Crips. Some of them are blood. Some of them are GDs or whatever. Be you. You don't have to be, the, you don't have to do what they're doing in the street. Just be that. And, you know, you'll attract that to, you know, you'll attract that positivity and the next thing you know, who knows who you'll impact? And that's why I say just do as much positive things as you can. You never know who you'll, you'll impact. And, um, yeah, I, I forgot the question, but that's, <laughs> that's, uh, I, I really pre, I, I appreciate him. He, the, the, just the way that 
he sticks to who he is even here in this country you know uh it's i mean it's mainly you know, white folks here but in this town he just sticks to who he is and he's got black folks white folks walking around with my uso gang all this kind of stuff you know on t-shirts like they're walking around with t-shirts they don't even know where someone is they just know this big mexican looking dude is walking around and he's they got uso shirts on they don't know that that's brotherhood it's, it's us we're over here doing our thing we're training and uh yeah that's uh aj epinesa's dad it, they live like you know not far from here that's what i want for our people to do everywhere don't get involved in no nobody else's stuff we have our own stuff we got our own we have our own it's not a gang but it's we have our own culture we have our own thing do that stay away from everything else Today's episode is brought to you by Nuttin' But Grinds, your go-to Hawaiian food truck in Utah. Are you in the mood for some island flavor? Nuttin' But Grinds has you covered. Their menu features mouth-watering dishes like the furikake mochiko chicken, crispy Korean fried chicken, and flavorful mo- mochisadas. Don't forget to try the musubi bomb, succulent pork belly, and fresh poke. Every dish is a celebration of Hawaiian cuisine and culture. So next time you're in Utah, make sure to stop by Nuttin' But Grinds. Experience the true taste of Hawaii right here in the heart of Utah. Nuttin' But Grinds. Aloha on a plate. Yeah, that's, that's similar to, I want to shout out a certain group here in Utah. They're called Day One. So D-A-Y, uh, one as in W-O-N. It's mainly those who have been incarcerated and they've come back and they kind of help a lot of people in the they form a group and a group and went and helped a lot of people in in the community even though they're their circle they have a circle they, they they hold basketball camps for the youth feed the homeless and all these things but they, they they're all about positivity and because of that positivity that they put out in the community it attracts a lot of people who want to do more and contribute to their cause. So uh, I was recently at one of their openings at one of the tattoo shops called Evolution Tattoos here in Salt Lake City. And I saw that sense of community that our people have, you know, the Tongans, uh, Samoans and all. Basically, the minorities here in Utah, they come together, they throw a huge barbecue just for a grand opening and and i I usually don't see that uh, amongst our people here in utah yeah you'll see little pockets of polynesians here and there but their influence i think is a very positive influence it's similar to the the full movement down in california Um, they're out there doing their own thing and trying to impact the community out there, even though they were incarcerated, they've been given a second chance in life to, to contribute to society. So that's what I admire with like the types of people who are out there. We shouldn't look down on, on their, the the things that they've done in the past, but you know, in life we move forward and we continue to make an impact and leave a legacy for ourselves and if not, just do it for, for our kids. That's mainly why we do things as fathers now is leaving a legacy so that our kids can follow. And that's what the main thing that I want to do for this podcast. And hopefully our kids will carry on what we're trying to accomplish. It's already tough for men to talk, but here we are creating a platform so we can share everyone's story because everyone's story is unique, just like yours will right right you said something about uh the second chance man i'm so i'm still on my second chance high i don't use drugs i do no stuff like that but when somebody tells you you go into a room and they say well you there's a good chance 80 percent chance you're not coming out you're gonna go away and then when you come out of that room man that second chance that's so i'm still on that high I'm so grateful. Like, I just want to do everything that I thought I, that I thought I wanted to do and didn't follow through. I'm going to do it now. So, I mean, I got a whole bunch of things that, you know, I, I have lined up things that I didn't think all the way through. I'm just going to do it, <laughs> you know, because um, I got a second chance. 
and there's no i can't think of anything more high uh, i don't know if that's the right word but more um exhilarating than that than than to have a second chance so i definitely understand you know and like in my offense like you know they were breaking down like somebody could have died and all of that and i was like oh my god for real and i you know so other people were like when when people bring up these sort of opportunities not opportunities but when people bring up these sort of situations like somebody could have did this and somebody could did that i actually go through that in my brain like what well, somebody could have died oh my god somebody died oh somebody could have fell off the building or whatever you know i'm just throwing stuff out there in my mind it happened so i take myself through all of these things it, you know I, some people call it empathy i empathize with every sit situation or possibility that could have happened and that's just a b real roller coaster like i'm too old to be going through all these roller coasters like that so i'm like and the, by the end of it, all of it it's like oh none of it happened oh god i feel so relieved it's like none of that stuff happened you know nobody you know was affected by you know besides headaches and stuff like that i was so relieved and that I have a second chance that I just want to do everything. So now I'm going to tell my story. I don't care. Like, you know, I, I do have a lot of people like saying bad stuff. Like I wish, you know, you were locked up and <laughs> this and that, you know, I, so people say stuff like that, but I'm used to that for ever since I got online. You, if you're online, people are going to talk bad about you, period. I'm used to that. But now it's like, really like, you know, you, you shouldn't be here, this and that. I get it. But no, I'm glad nothing happened. And even more than that, uh, I'm really grateful for a second chance. And exactly what you said, I don't look down on people who have a second chance. If, if they got it and they're actually using it to do something with it, then God bless them. But keep doing it. Don't stop. So to me, it's just more motivation. The hate is more motivation. Just thinking about a second chance is more motivation. So nothing's going to stop me now. I'm just going to keep on going and you're going to see more of me just doing different stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad you got, we got the chance to, to chop it up with you. Um, thank you for, for sharing your journey. I want, I want to target something that is important, especially for us who are Afakasi, considered Afakasi in the either the Samoan or Tongan, whatever. Pacific Islander community, a topic that you, you, well, not a topic, but a, a, a word that you brought up in your documentary that you defined that I really understood was the word plastic that's used amongst our Polynesian Pacific Islander community. You defined it very good in your documentary. And could you define it again for our listeners? And, and what are, have you, you been your experience so far with that word because the word plastic i never heard of the word plastic until i came to the u.s it wasn't widely used back in i, I don't know about ati but the word plastic never really came up i was called all these racial slurs because i was chinese but the word plastic never really came up so or well, i've heard plastic my whole life so plastic meuli well meuli wasn't like all like that, but, uh, well, that's a whole nother topic. So plastic is, is a fake. You're fake. You're not, a, you're not Samoan Samoan. You're a plastic Samoan. You are artificial. And I, I think I first heard it in high school and it, you know, it takes me aback because like, well, man, I, I do more than a lot of y'all do, <laughs> you know, so I'm plastic because I'm half black. I'm plastic because I can't speak the language. I'm plastic because, you know, what, what makes you authentic you know so what makes me artificial so that it just adds more insecurity so one of the things that um you know w when i started doing this work is i know noticed that a lot of people were being called plastic that was one thing that pushed people away from the culture and i i wish people would understand like if we could have we, we would be a much stronger presence in the world and we would have a much stronger movement. Everything that we do would be a much stronger movement if you just get rid of the plastic stuff. People want, they want to, they want to come to the culture. And when I say I got hundreds and hundreds of people that 
have emailed me or, or what do you call it? Instagram or an email. They send me messages and say, I, I want to be part of the culture. I want to do this, but I get called plastic. I get called fake. I get called this and that. So they have their own insecurities because the people, the gatekeepers that don't want, you know, who, who say who's authentic and who's not, they drive everybody away. Why would you do that? That you're, you're weakening your own, your own army. So we're stronger together. So I propose let's get rid of the whole plastic thing. That's it's it's not a it's not productive to our society at all, our culture at all. So bring these people in back to the culture. So, and I do mention this in the documentary as well. Like the whole language movement was like, okay, if you teach these people the language, because my insecurity was the language, learn the language, and then so you can you can sun a lot of these people because they can't speak it. Or they know like the slang language. But if you come and you can speak on a Tusi Pa'ia level or like a, a more formal level, then, okay, does that make me a better Samoan? Does that make me more, less plastic or whatever? It doesn't matter what you do. They're going to call you plastic because that's how they don't let nobody put you in a box. Just do just do you. So figure it. Um, if you want to learn the language, whatever makes you feel like, you are closer to your culture. Do that. People are going to call you plastic anyway, but you're not going to define who I am. And I, I just think if we get rid of that, we can be a much stronger culture, stronger society. And I don't know. I, I don't think people understand. Oh, to define it. Plastic is a is to me is derogatory. You're putting people down. And you're either Americanized or maybe you're, um, maybe you grew up in New Zealand. I don't know if anyone here from New Zealand or Australia, Australia, anywhere. So, or you just, you don't know Samoan culture all like that. So they, they just kind of put you in this culture like, oh, you're not, you're, you're not a real Samoan. So I think if, if the people, the, the gatekeepers of the culture, if they just, well, not, you know what? It's not even so much on them. It's on yourself. You are someone. If you if you say you're someone, if your mom, saw, your dad is someone, then you're someone. If they're both both of them are someone, I've had even um, notes from people born and raised in someone. They're called plastic because they can't speak the language. You're still someone. So don't make don't let allow someone else to make you feel a certain way. Just learn your culture, learn your language, get, uh, get up on that. But don't let anybody define you. And um, that's a insecurity that, that I developed on myself. I allow people to tell me that I was not Samoan, even though that's all I knew. That's how what, okay, if if that's all I if that's all I know, and you're telling me I'm not Samoan, dang, well, what am I? You know, so I allowed somebody else to, to make me in that headspace. That's a crazy thing to do. Don't let nobody make you feel like that. And if I showed you, I, I could just lines and lines of notes of people that just told me that same thing. It's my, my same story over and over and over. So what I wanted to do, my motivation to teach the language was to um, to make people feel like you are who you are. If uh, the language helps you bring you closer to the culture, then Learn your language. Whatever you need to do, just just do that. And um, yeah, don't let anybody put you in a plastic box. I don't. I don't want to get f philosophical here, but uh -huh. um, a lot of the issues that I feel that stems from you know a lot of this animosity going on in our own culture in our own Samoan is because you know if you really think about it, going back into our history, right. Samoans, like even the Hawaiians, even the Tongans, we're it's uh we're a class society, meaning that in our in in go, you know back in the day there used to be just workers, you know these farm the land, and then in the middle you got the uh, you know the you know inside the house, and then you have in our in our culture we have the the matai system, so you have the high class matais, you know the li'i, the chiefs, the kulafales, and then you have the working class. And then even in our culture, if you really think about it, there's two there's two types of distinct languages. You have the regular Samoan speaking language, and then you have the Matai speaking language. So that's when when you hear 
you know, during ceremonies and fall of love is a lot of these Matais, they're speaking almost a whole nother language that's actually parables. If you really think about it, those are parables, you know, words that that I feel today are are being gate uh are being gatekeeping uh, or you know, gate kept, you know, because yep. you know, there, there's only a certain class that hey, they they want to be known for you know, we, our family, we speak uh, the Matai language. Oh, like even even in our tattoo, you know, tattoo. There's only specific families in 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 Samoa that only does tattoo, you know, and they don't want to share their you know their art because hey, nowadays if we share our art, then you know we're not gonna you know everything is kind of like money nowadays. But back in the day, that's how it was, you know, classism. You know, you got the specific the people that went to do fishing and all that stuff. So coming here, uh, a lot of our families, like back in the day. When they traveled, you know, because we're, we're also known as the Navigator Islands, you know, mm-hmm. when, we, when they initially came to the States, they wanted a better life for their kids. So, i.e., they never wanted their kids to speak the language. They wanted mm-hmm. them to learn the whole new language of some, of English, you know, because to them, learning like it, learning, you know, Samoan for them going, you know, I'm just I'm just thinking this, you know, in, in a general sense of like how our peoples came to the to the states and you know even to new zealand they they wanted to incorporate that culture because to them you know living in, in samoa you you in samoa you know you, we were living in the poverty line you know like below the poverty and to them they thought oh you know uh, you know we were uh, farmers were fishermen and you know this is all we know so when we came to the states we want something a life better for our kids so i.e they they wanted them to just you know move away from the Samoan way because this is how we live back home. And so we want something better for our kids. But now, you know, they didn't give, give that decision to the kids. You know, now like, you know, our co- you know, like, you know, we're, we're, we're a product of that. You know, our, 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 our parents came to the States. They didn't want us to do this, but they didn't give us that decision. They, to me, I, I feel like it, 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 it should have been, you know, taught anyhow, you know, instead of just like, Hey, you know, learn English. You know, don't speak Samoan in the house. And I feel like because a lot of my cousins that lived in Cali, a lot of them don't even, they, you know, they they don't even know how to speak Samoan. You know, and to me, I don't I don't feel like uh, that that's not their fault. But at the end of the day, uh, I don't want to blame the, the parents, too, because they had, you know, a, a, a picture in their mind where, hey, I want something better for my kids. I don't want right. them to go through the things, the same things that we grew up in Samoa back in the early 70s, you know, uh, 80s or even going back way further, 60s. So, you know, but today, now that we, we're, we're grown up, we, we, we see this, and that's kind of like a detriment in our, our part now because, you know, now the kids, hey, we want to learn the language. We want to be incorporated in our, in our culture because that's important for, for establishing identity, right? So, you know, yeah. and identity is very important because without identity, man, you don't even know where, who, who you are, you know? Like, so when, when you mentioned uh, the dad, Epinas' dad doing that, he, to him, that, that's genuine that he's doing, you know, exactly what our, our culture is. Even though if you don't know how to speak uh, our language, if you, you know, you showing love is what Samoan is all about. Lo- love right. that, and to me, like that, at the end of the day, Samoan people are, are, are one of the most alofa. You know, we use al- alofa is very important in our culture. Like no matter what language, if you don't even know how to speak the language, you know, that love is, is always key in, in our, our foundation as Samoan. So, so what, what do we do? What do we do as, as kids, you know, that there are Afakasis and, you know, kids that are born and raised here in the States? Our option is your own decision. If you want to dive into it and learn the language. And I think that's where kind of like the issue is. There's not a lot of universities aside from Hawaii, University of Hawaii that teaches Samoan. Like there's different levels of Samoan that you could actually go there and you, you'll learn the culture. And, you know, but at the end of the day, I, I think it comes down to each individual. Like if you want to learn the language, you have to do it. You know, you have to right. do it because nobody else is going to teach you. You know, nobody else is going to teach you, you know, so, you know, we got we got all this, you know, uh, technology now that it's so easy to learn from the Internet than what it was 20, 30 years ago. You know, so, you know, and I'm just, you know, adding on to what you were saying, Will. So, you know, uh, the, the 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 main important thing is just understanding that, you know, our history and knowing that, you know, at the end of the day, you become who you want to be. But. You have That's the decisions it. that that you want to make. If you want to uh, learn Samoan, and if you're Afakasi, learn both sides. You know uh, that's why I, I, I love Tan because he's embracing both of his sides, and I love your your you two as well. You, 
you guys are all embarrassed. I'm I'm from uh, uh you know I'm I'm straight up full Samoan. Both my my parents are Samoan, but I I would say this you know I would say that you guys are more culture than me. And the reason why is because you guys have both, you know, both sides of the spectrum. You know, you're more culture. You have the the meuli or the the black side. I don't want to say meuli because you know, kind of offensive. You know, the woke folks. But you know that that uh, afakasi side. You know, you guys have that that you know more culture in, in a way because you're, you're there's two sides. For me, I'm yeah. only there's only one side. You know, I only got the Samoan side. You know, I, you know, so you know, at the end of the day, I agree, brother. Become who you want to be. Do it with love, though. You know, do it with love. Yeah. You know, so and that's that's key. <laughs> well, the, to me, there's nothing wrong with even just the Samoan side, but it's like the the thing is like, and, and you brought up our parents. So when they came here, so I'm my my mom first generation to America. You know, so it's like she didn't want to really push it off, like or or it, it's better just not to speak Samoan. Period, because in their mind it's a better life if you know english and you know this english ways but then like you said the backside of that is well the kid wanted to know Samoan. the kid now the kid's insecure now the kid don't know none of that stuff but their intentions were good their intentions were to to have so for you could have a better life over here but you know we're, we're saying we want to know you know we're in our 30s and our 40s, and we're trying to figure out how to be Samoan. We don't know the culture. We don't know this and that. We don't know the language. This is what we want. So I think just moving forward, if you are Samoan and you know these things, pass them on to your kids. Pass the language on. Uh, when they come home, just speak Samoan. You know, when they uh, do, do you know, take them to Samoan cultural things. If you're not around that kind of stuff, you know, you can still sh share what you know. That way they don't have to go on the internet and, and learn this and learn that. People complain about the stuff that, that I teach. And it's like when you're teaching to an entire diaspora and you have different generations, you have different locations, people are going to complain. They do it all the time. And I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? So, you know, there's words that the younger generations don't use that the older generations use. It don't matter what I say. People say, oh, that's no, that's not right. That's, oh, uh, that's incorrect. Well, my mom told me that. You see, you want to tell her she don't know what she's talking about? And and my uncles, everybody say this with this word, but you you don't know the word. So you might have got C's and D's. What am I supposed to you know, I'm supposed to listen to you? So, but there's a generational difference. There's regional differences. I don't understand a lot of what people in Australia and or, or Australia, New Zealand, when they the, the the way they speak, the words they use sometimes, it it throws me off. So when you try to, when you, when you make one lesson for everybody in the world, people will say, oh, that's not right. That's not, no. Well, so I make myself just kind of standard based on textbooks that are, you know, that everybody can see. So I'm not making this stuff up. You call me plastic. Okay. Well, I'm telling you, this came from this source right here. If you don't believe what I say, you go, go there and then you can see that's where it came from. But that's kind of why well, I'm going off into something else. But that's kind of why I, I did like a sentence structure sort of thing as as opposed to like, OK, just say this and just say that and just memorize this and memorize that. If you know the sentence structure of it, that to me, that was kind of more universal. But, um, you know, I get a lot of like I said, I get a lot of correspondence from people all over the world. Someone's all over the world and they'll say, you know, the, this word ain't right or that word ain't right. One thing nobody really disputes is this is the way that we put the um our sentences together so that's that's kind of how i stick to uh the teaching but you know they'll they'll use expressions in new zealand that they won't they don't use over here they'll say things in um uh, australia that we don't use over here but um i i, I went all the way off of what you were talking about but but yeah there's we we have a very diverse community within our di or worldwide diaspora and um so we, we have things like classism like you talked about we have um colorism in our uh, in our community we have well, everything that minority communities have around the world we have it here which is a reason why i kind of backed off of a lot of of public speaking about different things related to our community because if you 
if we don't even understand it here and then we try then, I, then here i am trying to speak it out and trying to say it on tiktok or something like that well everybody now everybody's like, oh someone's are all they don't understand this or they're racist or that that well they don't we don't understand a lot of stuff in our own community so for me to be talking about it over here man my bad i'm i'm like i'm jumping all over the place but uh um, you good Usher. that's you good. that's a whole other topic let me i'll stop right there on that <laughs> like i said i don't want to get too philo- philosophical here because we could go all day man but yeah you, you hit it right on the head man <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh i was thinking of the word plastic and i just remember the word that was, was widely used in american samoa was palangitoi or palangitoi <laughs> so that was a word that was mostly used you know it, it made no sense even though we weren't palangi for the afghans to be called palangitoi or mm. those who were born in american samoa went to the u.s for a little bit came back now they know how to speak english to get paid they get told their palangi toy so Some any minor <laughs> yeah any yeah. any minor fluctuations from what someone thought a Samoan was you know we were called palangi toy so <laughs> that that was a word that came to my thought that's equivalent to plastic huh yeah <laughs> palangi toy okay yeah i know <laughs> i know plastics widely used over there in new zealand and australia but my luckily my cousins never threw that my way whenever we go visit on that side of the world. But I mean, even if I heard it, I'm like, that's dumb, <laughs> you yeah. know, coming from the American side, you know, cause once you get army brat and I was raised with black kids yeah. and you know, there's clown and roasting sessions all day long, especially since I didn't wear brand name clothes. So whenever, I don't know, people try to be mean. It's like, ah, uh, it, meh. All right. <laughs> but, um, let's say there's a, Young Samoan kid or an adult, any type of Samoan, never raised in the culture, and they want to take that first step to learning the language. Are there any resources that uh, you know of, Will, that they could access or, or look at to begin learning sentence structure or some of the foundations of the language? Yeah, I mean, there's um, there's a lot of people online now. When I first started, there wasn't any because initially when I came to do all of this stuff. I just wanted to be a student. I wanted to figure out and I didn't I didn't see anybody. So I made, you know, a workbook. The, uh, so if you look up like Mato, Mato, M-A-T-O-U, Samoan. So like uh, I got a workbook and then I made like flashcards and stuff like that. And I have a, also a class. I don't know when I'm going to do the next class, but it's a Zoom class. It's like an eight week course. Um, so I did that. But then over the over the years i started seeing other people do stuff there's uh like Samoan made easy there's uh say it in Samoan. like if you go on instagram tafanua there there's other i mean there's others um and they're they're easily to find now you can find them easily easily um there's a kid someone um resource on on youtube so th- th- i mean there's there's a few on there and i always try to point them point them that way but the, the first thing I would say, like if you would learn sentence structure and then um, as you're learning the sentence structure, like maybe learn uh, just the basic words, um, learn like maybe 20 nouns, like, you know, people, places, things like wolf, house, dad, mom, you know, things, basic things like that. Learn your verbs, maybe 20 verbs, run, walk, sit, talk, slap, you know, fit out, uh, you know, fight, stuff like that. And then learn like, um, you know, and, and then when you learn the sentence structure, it puts everything together. So to me, that is how I was able to put all of these words. Like I knew the words growing up, but I didn't know like when it would so I'm gonna start speaking real fast. I was like, oh, OK, OK, I'm a little lost <laughs> now. And, and then not only that, they're speaking in abbreviated form or they're speaking in slang. So it's almost like, um, you know. I, I teach it the formal way. So like I said, you can look it up yourself. And then also too, when I was growing up, they say, just read the Tusipa'iya, you'll you know, read the Bible, you'll get it. I never got it. I did it, you know, my whole life and I couldn't get it. But if you learn the sentence structure of it, you can look at the Tusipa'iya and then break it down. Even if you don't know the words, 
you can break it down, the, break down the sentence structure of it. And then if you don't know a word, just go look the word up. And then from there, you just practice every day. And the next thing you know, instead of, okay, I, I, I broke the sentence down. I don't know this word, don't know that word. Then you look the word up. Now you got it. So now it's, it's instead of stopping and going, you're, you're going through pages and pages of the two uh, of the Bible. And it's like, it's easy now. And next thing you know, everything you're kind of, you're fluent, but then like someone said before, when you get to the slang, it's almost like a different language. So, you know, the higher level of some or higher level of someone, but then you, you get into the conversation. It's like, Oh, what are they talking about? Cause they're, uh, everything is abbreviated. Then they got slang words. So this, it's almost like a whole nother um, language within the language. So to me, the easiest thing, just, just, just learn it the, the harder way. And then w when you get around people who are speaking, going back and forth between English and Samoan, to me, that's a whole lot easier. If, you know, just learn it that way, the higher way, and then, you know, get the slang and everything after that. So that's just my method. Everybody doesn't agree with that. I just want to, uh, and I, I think I kind of, I kind of mentioned it before. But when you when you're saying higher level Samoan, I just want to break it down to like you know listeners. And this is my my opinion. I don't claim to be a, a language expert, but I know I know of Samoan language enough to know that there is two levels of Samoan. You know mm -hmm. the Matai level language and then your regular language. And when you yeah. mean your regular language, you're you're adding all your slangs in there, everything that you know you could even throw pigeon in there. But when you're talking about higher level, you're, we're, we're, you're specifically talking about the Matai language when we're, you know, our or orators, when they're speaking mm -hmm. publicly and, you know, your Matais, your chiefs, your high chiefs, that's the language they're using. It's it's not really a language. It's just it's Samoan. But the, what they're right. utilizing, they're utilizing parables that that we've learned from, you know, our history. You know, and, mm -hmm. when, and when I mean parables, I mean like little moka o mwanganganga. Or mm -hmm. alanga upu, mwanganga alanga upu, uh, or it just means a, a phrase of 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 languages that were derived from our observation in in nature. So they mm -hmm. use that in in their in their speak in their in their talks or their or, you know when they're speaking publicly, you know, just to to and and what's so funny about it, it it's so eloquent, you know, mm -hmm. so it's so beautiful that you know. Uh, you really have to really think about nature to come up with stuff like that, you know, especially yeah. that the Matai level language. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm kind of sort of like kind of immerse myself in that, because as we come to our father's age, 30, 40s, you we are now becoming the leaders of in our own families. And now we're mm -hmm. going to be responsible for, you know, the, the family and then the Matai titles are going to be brought down to us. And now we're going to. You know, we we're, now we gotta represent our families, and in back in Samoa, even till today, you know, speaking that level, it, it's you know a lot of you you not only get paid well for it too, because you know I don't know if you see in the five lovers, you know those guys with the kokos, and then you oh, see yeah. hey hey uh lo lo ke you know you you know so you know, uh, you know that's what I'm just saying, you know, but um I, and I'm not thinking about that sense, I'm just thinking in the sense of like you know that's that's where I strive to to try to get my level of expertise in our in our language. So, you know, learning, you know, reading the Bible, you know, all the stuff that you mentioned are key to having a foundation. But once you you get that foundation, that's if and if you say that's that's okay for you, that's fine. But now when you want to take it to that next level, uh, you you get a, a kusi called a uh, falupenga, and falupenga okay. means uh, you know your 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 village's uh, structure of how it was it was formed and it has mm -hmm. all those big names in there. And then that's where the foundation of a uh, speech in, in Samoan culture is. You know the Falupenga and then from there you build on on how to do a launga or, you know, speech. And so that's mm -hmm. where I'm kind of like, you know, kind of moving towards, but I'm not there yet. I'm just a few poco guy on the, you know, behind the lava lava here. But hey, <laughs> thank you. So appreciate it, man. <laughs> Bravo, Bravo. Yeah, yeah. One way that is overlooked, and I even overlook this, the way of, of learning Samoan is simply those who are close to you, your your dad, your mom, 
your your cousins because we we overlook this because there's a difficulty in communication. This reminds me of a story from the Uso Uptown Suite when he said he wanted to learn Samoan. So after work, every day he went over to his dad's place and he took down notes while his dad taught him Samoan.、Mm-hmm. So that's one way of of learning a language is from the people who are close to you. It, it, It's difficult because、uh, you you, you kind of need the, the that collaboration and commitment between both parties, but that's another way to learn the language. Right, I, and this is what I always tell the people in my classes. I'm going to show you just the basic sentence structure. The best way to learn and practice your Samoan is the people around you every single day. Because the way that we're talking about it in here, or you know, in class, may not be exactly how the people around you speak. They're incorporating English, you know, because they don't know the words, you know. So they they'll they'll go back and forth. At, ultimately, the goal is to be able to communicate in Samoan with the people that are around you. Period. So I, and when we're talking about an entire diaspora. I can't do that. I don't know every, how to make a, a class for every single place in the world. So I'm going to give you the basics. Take this. You have to practice it. Otherwise, it's. I took four years of Spanish. Right. I don't know much of anything. So because I didn't practice it, and I always tell them when you leave here today, every single day, every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday tutoring, you leave here. Go practice with the people that are around you, but again, like you said,、uh, Michael, you have to have that commitment from the other the other people because for them it's just easier to speak in the language that you already know, which is English. I'm trying to speak Samoan, though, so speak to me back in Samoan the way that you speak it every day. So again, my ultimate goal is to be able to talk to you and mom and uncle and auntie and the people around me. Period. It doesn't matter what I learned, and I mean, it does matter what I learned in class. But、um, ultimately, I want to be able to adapt the the foundation of what I learned to what you guys are speaking. So that's I'm glad you brought that up. You know what's so funny is, you know, and、uh, you know, Mike brought that up. You know what's so funny is, you know, when you we we have a lot of gatekeepers within our own. You know, that's that's the sad truth. There's a lot of gatekeepers. You know, and、um, you know, in my situation. You know, my、uh, both my parents are Samoan.、Um, my dad, he doesn't. He had a, a a big surgery back in the day, and you know, I told this in our on our podcast about what happened to him. And he has a, a sort sort of a speech, you know, problem. So, for me, I'm trying to learn the higher level Samoan. I can't really rely on my my dad or my mom, you know, because you know, there it's just you know, I have to seek. Other avenues, you know, I have to go, like for example, get the, you know, that kusi to follow penga. I have to buy, or you know, or even like for me, my mindset now is like, hey, I don't want to just learn from anybody else. I actually want to go to university, you know, like for example, University of Hawaii. They have a really good Samoan program, and you know, which I I, I looked at, and you know, it's just, but immediately just touching to you know,、uh, you know, your folks that you know speak the regular language, you know. And just you know, just kind of like feeding back, going back and forth, and kind of learn. You know that that's one of the the perfect perfect levels. But when you have you know situations like in you know, like that where hey, you try to reach out to somebody and they're like, ah,、oh, no, you know,、uh, just stick stick to what you know. You know, kind of like gatekeeping type of thing.、Mm-hmm. It's really hard. You know, so now you know now you know like what you mentioned before. There's a lot of other you know we're using technology now to our advantage, and I just. You know, want to want to put that out there. Don't get dismayed or you know feel bad that hey, you know your your immediate people are not trying to trying to help you. Just you know, reach out. I'm just you know t- talking on basis of, you know on our listeners. Hey, don't 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 feel discouraged once you reach out to your you know your cousin or your you know your mom or dad. You know, there's all there's all other you know there's tons of other avenues for you to you know keep on learning. So you know going forward, you know that's that's what we got to do. Yeah, and also too is it is is hard to it's easy to speak you know or do what you know. So if, if you know someone, it's easy to just speak someone. But then it's like to teach someone is a whole different thing. So not only and everybody's different. So you have to like communicate in a way where they understand it. 
that takes patience. And it, it, a lot of times you're like, oh, we just speak English because that's we're, I, I just want to go to the store. Why why you, you know, so then they just speak English. So it takes patience. And um, a lot of people don't have that. So they just they, they make it easier for themselves. And that's just human nature. You want to make things that are easy for yourself. And if I already know English, you know English, you're trying to learn someone, but it's hard for me to, you know, I don't have the patience for you to figure this thing out. So this is speak English. I, that's been my experience. Like most people just take that route. And that's why a lot of us, you know, don't learn the language. And um, if we can just say, wow, you know, take just take a step back and say, there's a bigger, there's a bigger uh, goal here. And this, this person really wants to, to to learn my culture or our culture you know they they want to take part in this that's that's really big if you think about it so that's enough to invest in that person to give them that time but um we're just so in a rush all you know every single day that we don't want to just say a few words and 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 teach them the language but i think if just just take a few moments to teach your kids or teach, uh, you know, your friend, someone or whoever, there's a lot of people in the class now. They don't, they don't have no ties to someone What's or some people want to get a someone man, or, you know, they just, they're around someone's, <laughs> they just join the class because they want to learn someone or whatever. So, um, whatever. I appreciate it. The, just people just, they just want to, they want to know the language. So take the time, show them. All right. One quick life lesson I want to highlight from the documentary, which you can find on, was it Toto Lua? Toto Lua, yep. Lua. Oh, Okay. Yep. T-O-T-O-L-U-A dot com. Yep. You can purchase it there for four ninety nine, and it's uh, very well put together. Uh, I didn't know what I was expecting when purchasing it or even seeing the trailer, but watching it, I was very impressed on on how well your storytelling and everything was uh, put together greatly. But one quick life lesson I want to highlight from there is be kind, be kind to everybody you meet because you never know when they're going to be a key part to your criminal defense team. (laughs) Man. Hey, Uh, that not only that, I think the, some people, and I I don't want to say, well, I'm just, uh, one of those people, like the angels came around. I really feel like that. Like, so I, before going in there, so my mom saw more and she all the time, she calls me up and she'll be like, is something wrong? She knows. She already knows. She don't know the specifics, but she always has these dreams. And she said, well, you know, uh, your grand, you know, grandfather called me in my dream and he said this and he said that. She didn't say anything last week. Now, any other time she called me up and she warns me. Last week, she didn't say anything. And I was like, okay, I'm good. Cause otherwise she's my earth angel between her and other, other people. Like, you know, it, in the, you know, I, I mentioned, I don't think I mentioned it in the documentary, but, uh, you guys know El Chapo, the, uh, yeah. So El, the prosecutor was my defense attorney. The, uh, and my frat brother, he was, the, he's like one of the top prosecutors in the nation. I, I didn't grow up with him, but like I met him in college and he put everything together. So, I mean, how I still can't believe it when I think about, you know, all of the stuff that kind of put it, you know, if it weren't for them, I'd be gone. Like you wouldn't see me for a long time because initially they were talking 20 years and they, I don't know, of course they were trying to scare me because a lot of people, I think they got between anywhere between three and eight. I got probation because these guys just knew their stuff. I mean, the law doesn't really work for people that don't know or don't have these kind of resources. I I didn't have these resources. The only reason I got them, I, I can only attribute to to God and, and just, you know, things that just happened for me. There's nothing that I went out and did myself. Things just kind of fell into place. And um, if you know, last week I wasn't so much of a, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't go to church and things like that anymore, but like, um, you know, I, I just believe in a higher power and things fall into place for you. If you just put things, put things good out into the universe, kind of like what you were saying and things just come back. So that's what I want to do right now. So someone like today, I woke up and someone called me a snitch. Like you give snitch vibes or something. So I made a video about that 
And it's not, to me, it's not even about that. I, nobody knew about my documentary. Like it wasn't something that the government knew or anything like that. I feel obligated to, to put that back. I, I, I should be gone right now. If I was any other, um, anybody else, I would be gone. But these things th- that were extraordinary were in my favor. There's, I, I had no, no hand in that. I take no credit for none of that. So I say that I give all glory to God. That stuff happened for me. I didn't do anything to, to deserve that. So I got to put that energy back out there. So if, if that means dismantling this whole industry that I was involved in, I'll do it, whatever, whatever. So every day I, I wake up, I say, what do I need to do now? And, um, you know, I don't put a name on God or you no know, time or history. I don't put no color on God, nothing. I just, it's a spirit. So I just, I want to move with the spirit. So that's what I do every single, every single day now. Don't care what nobody say. I'm going to do me. And that, and that's what it is. I'm going to teach language. I'm going to bring down this industry, whatever, whatever it is I got to do. That's what I'm moving with that. And uh, every day in the morning, I figure out the next step. So seven hours from now, I'm going to find out what I'm going to do tomorrow. And I'm going to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's such a blessing because I've studied criminal justice. And what I've learned is a lot of cases, a high percentage, probably around the 90s, enter a plea bargain, especially within the the minority communities. And I'm glad that you you weren't suckered into entering a, a plea bargain because that's usually how most cases here, especially here in the U.S., end that way because a lot of our people don't know much about law and, you know, the criminal justice system. It's it's basically, I wouldn't say altered or kind of moved or what's the word, it, manipulated to, to, to where, you know, a lot of these lawyers and attorneys, they want a quick and efficient way of handling cases because a lot thousands of cases go into the to the court system and they're trying to like push them out quick so i'm glad that you were fortunate enough to come out on the on the good end of things especially with your situation right right and so and another thing about like mine a lot of people did just go into probation so, but they were trying to make an example out of me for, for whatever reason, but it, it's, I found out that this stuff is also political too, because a prosecutor, maybe they want to be a politician one day or they want to do this. So it's about their record. And like, I mean, she was really, she was really going in. I'm like, oh man, if, if I didn't, if I had like a public defender or something like that, gone, I would not be here right now. And um, so after I told my story, there was so I had some Samoan people, um, a whole lot of people were sending me notes like, can you help me do this and get and do that? And all I could tell them was like, I don't even know how I got this. stuff. You know, these are just people that I, I just so happened to meet because, you know, uh, like T was saying, like, you know, I was cool with this guy and he just things just kind of worked themselves out, you know, from that. It, was, it had nothing to do with me. So I, I can't get you you know, a half million dollar lawyer representation or nothing like that. The, the, the system is not really fair like that only because you got all, just like you said, all these people are coming through and they they want to handle things really fast. The people are taking pleas that, um, that are unfair, but they're, you know, someone tells them that, okay, well, if you don't take this plea, you're going to get 20 years instead of one. You know, so just, just just take the plea, take one year. Well, and they're trying to tell them, well, I'm innocent. I didn't do this. Well, the public defender don't really feel like defending you, <laughs> you know, so because there, there's a lot of work that they that they need to do. So and in my case, I went in, and I said, look, I'm guilty. So my lawyer just kind of went in and said, OK, well, he said he's guilty. We want to be give him what's fair according to the law. So if I were to go into that situation with a public defender, they would have just gave me w- whatever and say, okay, yeah, you know, but yeah, my, I, I believe mine was an extraordinary, extraordinary case only because of, um, you know, my representation and everybody ain't, don't have it like that. You know, 
unfortunately. I just want to make a quick comment. Uh, you mentioned like, and man, I think we we are you know we're we're kind of like a blessed people, you know. So more and more more to that's our model. It means uh, you know God first. And I was just gonna say, man, are we? Do you? I don't know, man. Like you mentioned, like your mom, you know, saying that she had a dream, and I'm just saying, like, are we gonna have that? You know, like that type of stuff. Because my mom, you know, so back in the day, right? I used to live in Cali, and from '95 to 2000. And I was going through some some rough patches, you know, after my grandfather passed away. And, you know, I was about to get into the streets back in back in Cali, man. And then but when when my parents came down to, for the funeral, uh, my grandpa's funeral and they left to go to Samoa, I initially thought they were going to take me with them. But they left me there. Right. So long story short, uh, short, my my dad had a dream and the dream was that uh, that I had a hole in my back. And mm. so he he mentioned that to my mom, and then the the next week my my dad flew up, you know, flew up to Cali, and then you know he grabbed me and then brought me down. But I'm just saying, man, like, is this something that we 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 you know we're we're gonna get into? Like, we're gonna have stuff like that happen to us. Like, we're gonna have dreams where our kids, like, hey, you know, something's gonna happen to you. You know, you gotta do this. And I'm just because right. you know you mentioned your mom, and I'm like, you know, I'm thinking about my dad and how he had that dream. It's just kind of like that foresight type thing, which is interesting, man. That's that's man, that's crazy. I think we all have different gifts. Like, um, yeah, man. So uh, I, I have the dreams too. I just, I haven't talked really? about them yet. Because, you know, when you start speaking about these things to people, yeah, you're crazy. But no, Dude, I, I have, I've, I see things about just random people, wow. and um, I'll, I'll call them up out the blue, wow. and I'll, I'll just tell them like sometimes I don't say anything at all. I'll just say, mm-hmm. uh, you know, how are you doing? And yeah. they're like thinking I want something from them, and I don't. It's just yeah. I saw something. And then um, I just want, you know, I want to make sure you're good and and everything. And that, that's happened several times. And for real, for me, the closer, the, the more pure in heart that I am. So, like, if I'm all about myself and I'm just thinking about everyday grind and all of that, I don't really have them kind of dreams. But when every day, just in my mind, if I'm all, all you know, thinking about, you know, how is this person? If I put other people first, that's when I get that gift. To me, it, you know, it's a gift. And, I, and now I'm able to see more clearly about it, it could be one of you. And if I hit you up, you know, I might not say anything. I'll just be like, man, you good? And you're like, man, what's the dude want? You're like, that's kind of weird. Is what, What's wrong with this guy? But no, I, I just want to make sure you're okay. And then maybe give you a word of encouragement. That happens. Well, it used to happen a whole lot. It just depends. Like I've been stressed lately. So in these kind of situations, I don't, uh, you know, don't really have it like that. But now I feel like that gift is going to come. And it's like clockwork. And when I start putting other people first and not thinking about myself or not thinking about my situation, I just, it's a gift and it comes. And just like my mom, that those dreams and, you know, like your people too, like the, it, it could be dreams. It could be, I don't know. It could be a whole bunch of stuff, but that's, um that's my particular, I, like I said, I haven't talked about it much, but that it's a real thing. It's a, you know, what we see is not, all real it's like sometimes it's that extra dimension like that's where i want to get to i want to be able to see that all the time and i i backed away from that that gift for a while because sometimes you see stuff and like man i didn't i didn't want to see that <laughs> i don't because now i feel responsible if i don't tell you and um and a few times i'm like you know god i don't i don't want to I don't want this gift. I don't want that. Whatever it is, don't show me these things no more because now I feel obligated to to say something and people think I'm crazy. So now, you know, it's like a double whammy. You think I'm crazy and I got to be burdened with your with your problems. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but I'm at the point now where I just, I want it all and it's not money. It has nothing to do with money or anything. I just want to be able to, to operate in a, in a place where I'm helping, helping people, you know, so. The revelation, very powerful. We're running low on time here. So we, in closing, or at least the closing question, what do you, what are your hopes, hopes and goals for yourself down the future? And also for your family, for your wife and children, what do you hope to see? Uh, that's pretty much straightforward. And I think my hopes you know kind of like what i was just saying i just want to go with the flow i want to be obedient to um you know what i'm told in the spirit 
you know, whatever it is, I just want to do that. And, you know, for my family, I hope prosperity and, and good health for everybody, for all of you brothers right here. I want great things for everybody, you know, the Samoan community, the people that, that I talk to on a regular, like I want them, I just want great things for everybody. And I want to play my part the best way that I can. And the only way that I can do that is just to be in tune. W whatever the spirit tells me to do, that's what I want to do. So yeah, it, 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 I want it to be less about, you know, just all of the extracurricular. I just want to be in tune with what I'm, what I'm supposed to do for, for everyone. So that's it. <laughs> right on. Thank you. Michael, did you have anything? Well, this will, this will be our last question. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a night field of last questions, but we, we like to, to ask our question because here in Beyond Love Lava, we like to learn and, and, and listen also. But do you have any questions for us? Um, oh man, I didn't think about that. Well, I, I think you guys are doing a, a great thing. I think that, um, you know, just continue, just be, consistent in what you guys are doing and what you are like I, I see you guys you know you never slacked off so i don't have any questions i just have uh, admirations and just like not even words of encouragement because you're already doing the things that you're supposed to do yeah I, I don't i don't have any questions for real yeah and, and i really appreciate you um coming on board and chopping it up with us uh, i i i really feel more understanding of you now mainly because i've seen you on social media and what i've seen is a total totally different vibe from you know our session today what i see is on social media is that you're stern and, and completely i wouldn't say a different person just a, a different kind of like a, a persona but what i see when i talk to you is more more authentic in the way that now i got to know you now I mm -hmm. admire what you do on social media. So that's what, what I'm trying to say. So thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Well, social, like I say, um, well, I said in a documentary, I, it's really hard for me to, um, you know, to record myself and to talk to a camera, you know, by myself. And then to know that everything you say is going to be scrutinized. Every, every little word, somebody's got something to say about it. And sometimes in the middle of what I'm talking about, even, even tonight, I lose my train of thought is because I'm thinking about, okay, don't go, don't go off rail. You go off the rails. Don't say this, don't say that. And then, so I lose my train of thought. So I try to, when I'm on camera, you know, and, and I post something that's very, it's not scripted, but it's like, if I said something bad, I cut it out and, and then, then, you know, go back and do it again. So it's really like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. But, you know, this is a, a natural conversation, you know, so this 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 is more real than as opposed to online. But I mean, it's still me, but it's like a more calculated version of myself as opposed to just regular conversation where I don't don't feel as uh, judged or whatever it is that makes me feel like, OK, stop, record, stop, rec you know, that sort of thing. I, I like this format much better. Oh, I don't have much to say, Will. All I want to say is, man, continue to be blessed, uh, spirit on you, you know, and all your future endeavors, everything that you're doing. And this goes with, with all of us, you know, there's, there's spirits out there that's, that's to bring us down. But as long as we walk within the light and stay within the light and, you know, bring prosper and joy to everybody that we meet. And that's what I like to do too, you know, to anybody that I meet, you know, I just, uh, you know, just give them, you know, strength, blessing, you know, I don't have, I don't have that, you know, but from, from the spirit above God, you know, continue to, to put his hands uh, on you and, you know, everything that you're doing going forward, brother. Thank you for giving, taking out your time out of your day, your busy schedule to, you know, come up on here and chop it up with us and sharing your thoughts and your, the deep situations that you've been through. And, you know, it's, it's for anybody that's really difficult and really hard to even share, it's, you know, their personal lives and you you know coming on here and doing that with us that's I really appreciate it and you know uh hopefully uh you know we'll see you again in the future you know we are looking for a <clears throat> mc for our uh you know for, 
<laughs> for our dinner so, coming up, you know. So, you know, just a hint, hint, you know. Uh, but other than that, uh, thank you, brother. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I can't go nowhere. <laughs> Unfortunately. All right. Nameless. Unmasking the anonymous life of a sex pill guru at t o t o l u a dot com. Go and get it and watch it. I will the way you assemble everything is genius. I hope to see more, a lot more content from you in the future, and I hope people hit you up uh, for more deals. Shout out to the Goldsmith family, to the Fanene family. And shout out to Mark David Hunter and Adam Fells for keeping the Uso off the, out yes. of prison and free. Right, thank you very much. All right. This has been Behind the Lava Lava. Signing off. Okay, Have a good night. Five, four. Working on my interests, it's who I am. who I am. I'm trying to make these digits look like EINs. When the help ain't free, you all help me. Help. Salute to folks who turn their names to LLCs. Okay. The wealth is in itself to help a nonprofit. Right. To be better women or better men, whether business by veterans or common folks with a dream. a dream. We're all born with the same strength. We tread waters and we're untouched. Let's be on the same wavelength. Behind the lava, lava, front of our eyes. Let our legacy live off it when we're up in the sky. All signs point to us to help someone make a difference. With God is my witness, let's talk business.